Welcome to chapter two of Evernight by Ross Mackenzie. Chapter two is called Beneath the Streets. Remember that there is a copy of this in the document on our classes website for you to read along with. Um, and there is also a new Padlet on the EduBlog site where you have got some new questions to answer and put up on there. So chapter two, Beneath the Streets. Larabel Fox was sheltering in the tunnels beneath the city when she heard a commotion. She almost didn't notice, such was the great cacophony of rain and wind and rushing water barreling through the darkened sewers. Rivers of rain had fed the stream, leaving many of the tunnels inaccessible. Fierce water rumbled past her feet, splashing her wax-coated boots, gurgling and foaming, carrying twigs and leaves and drowned rats and cats. Lara's eyes were sharp and alert, and they flicked here and there and all about, watching the water as it passed through the golden light from the dragon breath lamp tied around her neck. Her muddled reflection stared back at her from the rough surface, 13 years old and brown skinned and fiercely focused. She was hoping to glimpse shining things in the waters, coins or lost jewellery. But it was not a treasure that caught her attention now. It was the sound of an argument. Lara extinguished her lamp at once and crushing darkness folded in on top of her. A newcomer to those tunnels would have been instantly lost, disorientated, panic-stricken. Not Lara. Lara breathed deep and stayed calm. She knew every twist and turn and dip of the sewers in the same easy, natural way a small child might know the rhythms of a nursery rhyme. Creeping forward, she followed the voices, the sound of her footsteps smothered by the stream. Around a bend she went, to an intersection where several sewers met. Light spilled from an adjacent tunnel, and Lara slowed, crouching low against the smooth, cold brick. She peeked around the corner, tingling with curiosity. There were five of them, five boys. Each was dressed in a tosher's things, a wax-coated jacket and boots and gloves, with a dragon breath lamp hanging around his neck. Four of the boys were large, almost men, but the fifth, the fifth was younger and much smaller. The fourth larger boys were formed a circle of sorts around the smaller one. Lara knew him very well indeed, for she had taught him the ways of toshing herself. His name was Joe Littlefoot, and he was looking around at the others with fierce, frightened green eyes. It's mine! His hand hovered protectively on the toshing bag slung over his shoulder. I found this stuff fair and square. I'm not even on your patch. Well, we've decided to expand, said one of the older boys. His head was pale and shaved, his voice gravelly from all the pipes he smoked. Vin Cotton was his name, and Lara knew all about him and his gang and was wary of coming across them. I reckon the tunnel running under Milk Street belongs to us now, which means the loot you find here is ours, he pointed to the bag. You can't just claim tunnels, cried Joe. And who's going to stop us? You? Lyra bristled at this, felt her hackles rise. Toshing was not a noble profession, perhaps, but there had always been a sense of honour to it, an unspoken respect between the folks who risked their lives to find lost things beneath the world. To be a tosher took guts and smarts and bravery, and Lara thought that Cotton had none of these things. He was a coward, a bully. Last chance, he said. Joe shook his head. I need whatever I can get. My granny, she needs looking after. Cotton held up a finger to quieten him. Then he brought a knife out from his coat and pushed the point of the blade against Joe's throat. Not enough to draw blood, but certainly enough to frighten Joe out of his wits. Lara almost cried out. 
Don't give a hag's tongue about your granny. You need to learn a lesson in respect, sunshine. He nodded to the others. Take everything he's got. They closed in. Thinking quick, Lara reached into her own toshing bag and brought out a bent metal spoon she'd found in the tunnels earlier. She stood up, reared back, and threw the spoon as far down the sewer as she could manage. It hit the wall with a clang, and Cotton and his gang spun around and held up their lamps. Who's there? Run, Joe, run! Lara stepped into the light, and Joe's eyes grew wide. He broke into a sprint, his wax-coated boots splashing through the water towards her. Then they were away, twisting, turning through the tunnels, the stinking air filled with curses and threats from Cotton and his gang. Son of a hag! Get them! You're dead! Put your light out, Lara told Joe. He did as she said, and soon they were running almost blind through the tunnels, guided by memory and instinct. Nearest way out? asked Joe. Lara tried to calm her breathing, pictured the sewers in her mind. Needle Street. They tore along to a spot where the tunnel forked in two, and they took the path to the left. Vin Cotton and his gang chasing, yelling, gaining. Still they ran, gasping and panting until something awfully wrong dawned in Lara's head, making her skid to a halt. Why have you stopped? Shh! You notice something? Yeah, I've noticed you stopped. Come on! Lara didn't budge. The air had changed. She tapped her foot on the tunnel floor. The sewer stream. Where's it gone? The rushing sewer water had become a trickle. What does it matter? Come on! No, something's not right. Lara fumbled for the lamp around her neck, sparked it to life, and honey-coloured light pushed back the darkness. Joe began to shout at her, and then he stopped and stood by Lara's side. The two of them stared up the tunnel. A short distance ahead, the walls had collapsed inwards, and the way was completely blocked by brick and debris. Back the way they had come, Cotton was sloshing up the sewer. There was no way out.